First, thank you for the invitation. It's also a bit of a bizarre talk to give because I'm going to have a bit of a sales pitch to people that are already here. So um, hopefully that motivates you to stay. Uh, right. So I've been asked, and I should say that it is not uh, really scientific saying it's about like what are the main objectives here, a little bit scientific, but also what we're doing, who is involved, how is it to be, um, to come and join my team here in Nottingham and to explain a bit how we do things here. And the first thing is if someone asks me why I like it here, um, what is the biggest bonus being in Nottingham? And then the first thing I would say is um, because of the colleagues, because of the people. So I call this team Nottingham. Or, um, and so there's a bunch of us, uh, some people are new. <laughs> um, but what, um, what this slide really shows, and I think this is rather remarkable, is um, not that I have such a big group, this is by far not true, but uh, it's, let me start with the perhaps older people here, is a bunch of colleagues. And uh, that's what makes it special, that allows us to really combine theory and experiment here in Nottingham where there are a bunch of us experimentalists, that is Tony Kent, Richard Hill and myself. And then we partnered up with um, calculational powerhouses such as Jorma here, Tassos, and then it's not all of it. Uh, so we have Jorma is in the School of Mathematical Sciences, so am I, surprisingly. Tassos is from physics, Tassos is a cosmologist doing theory, Yarma um, is, I guess, expert, I would say, gravity and quantum field theory. Um, Tony is doing quantum optics experiments. Richard is doing strong gradient magnetic fields experiments. And now comes the part which I'm very proud of. Um, it doesn't stop there. We uh, also work with Lena Janssen. We have a joint grant, and she's from philosophy. Um, it's fantastic to work with her. Then we have Ulrike Kuchner. She has a degree in art and science. She's an astronomer and a scientist and an artist. And then uh, recently also uh, as part with the grant with Lina, we're also working with Marco and he is in mathematics and he works on what's called the inverse problem. And what is also wonderful is that with not all of them, but with um, the first three people here, I'm sharing joint PhD students. And that I think is a, is a wonderful experience for PhD students here because they have double the advice they can get, double the expertise. And in particular, um, i shown here uh, the team, but that's actually some of the students are not really my students, I would say. Perhaps I'm somehow a second supervisor, but sometimes even not that. They are Yorma students, but what I really like about this is that our students just merge groups. And they did this without us asking us, so that means they really wanted it, and I think that's wonderful. So that's, um, that's us here in Nottingham, but we are also part of the UK. And something that I think is a wonderful opportunity for people working in this group because they also become part of a wider network that's called Quantum Simulators for Fundamental Physics. Tony Yorma and myself are on this. So if you look at that, who is part of that, that seven research organization are sort of nicely from a political viewpoint sprinkled out the, um, throughout the UK. And so how many people are involved and what are we doing? So, um, so first the scientific goals. So quantum simulators of, we want to build a network of quantum simulators for black hole and early universe processes. Um, the community is 50-50 quantum technology and fundamental physics researchers. Uh, we have 27 people funded from, through this network grant, uh, but we also have 48 partners and not just within the UK, but also abroad. Um, there's a governance of three people that have to do all the unpleasant stuff, and I'm part of that. Um, the experimental facilities, as I said, it's here and experiment combined. So the fundamental physicists, they provide um, high-level modeling for our experimental systems, and those are placed at, um, first one is uh, St. Andrews, Nottingham, Cambridge, and Royal Holloway, London. Okay, so... And I think this is a wonderful uh, opportunity because it shows that this is a timely area of research 
it shows that there is a big interest within the country, many connections people can make. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. And I wouldn't be aware of any other country in the world that would support this line of research as much as the UK is currently doing it. So um, we're very thankful for this support, but we're also working very hard. So this started in 2021 and what has come out of it, one patent application still pending, 25 publications, six preprints, four feature news articles and four wonderful quantum simulators. Okay, so what are we interested? What's the physics um, beyond going down to a particular system? And what does it mean? So, so where, how does this all come together? This fundamental <coughs> physics and quantum technology. So perhaps what I should say is what we are primarily interested in is quantum field theory. And quantum field theory or any field theory can become interesting when something is happening. And there can be two basic classifications you can make. And the one is that you say, well, the fields are what we call non-interacting or the fields are interacting. So for interacting fields, you can have scattering processes. For non-interacting fields, you don't have scattering processes, but you can have conversion processes. You can have other things happening. Uh, but of course, if there's just a non-interacting field, this could be a bit boring. So you have to add something interesting. And so what you can do is you can stick this non-interacting field on a curved space-time geometry around a black hole in the early universe. Or you can ask about these field theories, which we are interested in. I should say that these are relativistic field theories. You can ask about the measurement process. As Jorma showed and explained, and we had other talks about, does everybody agree on the presence or absence of particles? And how do you, me how do you measure quantum or relativistic quantum field theories? So, but and of course, also then you say, well, interacting fields can be really interesting. So, um, can go through um, um, highly non-equilibrium processes they can scatter, you can have scattering <coughs> processes, as Sylvia mentioned already and Sean, as part of this preheating scenario. But you can also ask yourself, well, what if um, I have an, um, a field theory and that's meter stable and it can decay and undergo phase transition? It's a wonderful, interesting and hard problem uh, when we are looking at quantum fields undergoing, for example, um, um, first and second order phase transitions. Okay. So I have a few slides where I go very quickly through um, the motivation uh, for me to start working on this field is linked to Bill Andrews' seminal paper in 1980, where he realized that uh, looking at sound waves in fluid flows, that you can have two different situations. So you have, suppose you put a little speaker into the fluid flow and you look how sound propagates through your medium, your, your liquid. And then he realized, well, if I, have, uh, if I add the speaker where the flow is su uh, subsonic, so the flow speed is slower than the sound waves in the system, they can go in both ways. <coughs> However, the situation changes very much if you were to put the little speaker uh, downstream of a waterfall, and let's assume the waterfall um, starts, uh, is increasing in, velo increasing in velocity, and I can define an area such that everyone in this area, the background flow equals the sound speed at that point. And so all the sound waves will get dra uh, dragged down um, 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 downstream. Sorry, I was looking for that word. And so that gave him the idea that perhaps you can set up acoustic horizons in this system. And then he went back, he gave a lecture in fluid dynamics when this came about, and then he did the math and he found actually uh, it's not just a conceptual analogy, it's really strong, it's a mathematical analogy. And as Yama said, if the equations are the same, the physics should be the same. And uh, in particular, he managed to, to write for small fluctuations, so you use perturbation theory, he wrote this in this very compact way, and I will talk about in a bit what this psi, psi field is really, but he has this really compact wave equation, and here there is this GAB, which we identify as a metric tensor, and this metric tensor here is provided by the background flow. So it's perturbation moving relative to this medium. And this equation, 
and I can be very fast because you all know that, um, sorry, this equation comes about when we try to write down fields, classical and quantum fields, and we write down, for example, uh, start with it's a simple and ad hoc extension for the people who are not familiar perhaps with, with quantum fields or in curved spacetimes or analog gravity. You can ask a question, so if I look at the wave equation for some scalar field, uh, I can write it in this very compact way, introducing a Minkowski spacetime geometry. And so this is just a rewriting in a way, but it, has, it gives you an advantage because once you have the equation in this form, you can say, what if my scalar field is not residing on a, on a flat space-time geometry? What if it is residing on a curved space-time geometry? And what you can do is an ad hoc or minimal um, uh, extension of this by simply replacing your flat space-time geometry with a curved space-time geometry. And this is a very reasonable extension. <coughs> it's not the only way, perhaps, to write down a scalar field on a curved <coughs> space-time geometry, but it is the most simple, so the simplest approach to translate field um, dynamics from a flat to a curved spacetime geometry. And so, and this is what in quantum field theory in curved spacetime, in classical field theory in curved spacetime, what people use mostly as a starting point. And this is exactly the, the equation that Bill found looking at these fluid systems and sound waves propagating in fluids. And so here's the analogy, and then, okay, you say, well, it is a neat analogy. It seems, seems rather bizarre that this, 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 thing, this part of mathematics drops out of these systems. What I think is also really nice is that in the analogs, you can derive this set of equations, while when it comes to field theory and curved spacetimes, you have to ad hoc write it down. So, no, nevertheless, it's a simple equation. Here we are still considering non-interacting fields, just how fields are residing on a, cur on a general curved spacetime geometry. But the thing is with classical and quantum fields in curved spacetimes is that it really matters. And when does a theory matter? And to me as an experimentalist, or when something matters is if it has some prediction, if something is happening, if there's an interesting physical consequence or process. And so, and I think that is also distinguishing, in my opinion, quantum field theory and curved spacetime from many quantum gravity candidates where they're wonderfully in a sense of a fundamental approach, but where there's very little um, observable consequences or physical consequences. So I think in this sense, quantum field theory and curved spacetime is a wonderfully interesting theory. And if you go through this and we have um, talked already about this uh, to some extent, to some of them. There are wonderfully, um, wonderfully interesting physical processes and consequences coming out of this, I would say, almost rather simple extension from flat to curved spacetimes. So um, the most prominent one is the one uh, discovered first by uh, Stephen Hawking, where he looked at how quantum fields behave around a black hole, and he realized that the black hole although classically absorbs everything through a quantum process, it can radiate away its mass and that stop there's the Hawking radiation. Um, a classical process, but also has a quantum equivalent, is, well, what if I have a rotating black hole? Can the rotating black hole um, interact with, it, with it, uh, its environment and sort of radiate off its angular momentum? And yes, there is this process that's called superradiance when you, look, when you work with waves and it's called uh, Penrose superradiance when you work with massive particles, massive objects around. Uh, and, but also, um, sometimes, although, although quantum physics uh, is not usually the dominating force, if you go back to the very early universe, to the early universe, uh, it's dominated by quantum, we, we believe it is dominated by quantum physics, by quantum fluctuations. There was nothing else to begin with. And the question is, how can we turn from nothing from these quantum fluctuations, get to everything that we observe today? And so, again, you use quantum field theory, and there's a process that would allow us to uh, consider, for example, the large-scale structure, or would be the seeding process for the la large-scale structure, and its origin would be in this um, quantum field theory <coughs> framework. And the other thing you've heard already a lot about it, because Yorma is one of the leading experts on this, is related to the Andrew effect and the fact that um, an accelerated observer and an inertial observer, they disagree on the presence or absence of particles. 
So this is the measurement problem within relativistic quantum field theory. And that's, uh, to me, it's one of the most fundamental processes you can think about it. Is something there or not? How much more basic can it be? So super interesting. Now, I said quantum field theory in curved spacetime is superior in some way because it predicts all of these wonderful effects. But there is a problem. And uh, it's a problem perhaps not many theory, theorists are so much concerned about. But as an experimentalist, uh, it almost nullifies all these <laughs> wonderful effects that should come out of the theory. And the, que the problem is um, beautiful theoretical effects predicted, however, no experiment, no observation. And this is, for me, that was the motivation to, to turn to something different, what's called analog gravity, and the idea to set up these effects into a controlled laboratory environment. And in particular, um, there's a broad class of system where this um, analog gravity, which can facilitate an analog gravity um, experiment, and that means that small perturbations are, to some extent, governed by this simple equation for scalar fields and curved spacetimes. But um, I'm personally mostly interested in liquids. And I'm interested in normal and quantum liquids, because I also find it always extremely interesting and important to compare what more do you get when you actually use a quantum system compared to a classical system, or normal liquid in this case. And what I'm interested in is um, uh, interfaces that form. So it could be between two liquids or um, a gas liquid, but in general I'm interested in two-dimensional slices uh, on, on classical and quantum liquids. And this is what uh, we are mainly focusing on in Nottingham here from an experimental point of view. Okay. So, and I want to put this a bit in context, but I should be fast because I want to tell you also a bit more of what we're doing here. But so the idea is we have this set of equations, it's very universal, comes out of many systems. And one of the things which I also wanted to talk about is which quite, um, what is this psi field here? And this psi field here is actually um, in fluids. You have density and velocity perturbations. And what this psi field is, if you take a fluid and you assume the fluid to be irrotational, you can write the velocity field as a gradient of a scalar field. And that perturbations in this scalar is where you get this equation out. So if you see something like that, perhaps it's not the best analog. But what I wanted to show, what I wanted to make clear here is these are not the density, <coughs> these are the velocity perturbations in the system. The relation between the two is similar as fields and conjugate momentums, and this takes the role here with phase and density fluctuations or interface fluctuation, depending on what your medium is. So um, it all started in 81 with Bill Unruh, and what he started with initially is the Navier-Stokes equation, and then basically he took the Navier-Stokes equation and he did what every theorist does, he throw everything away, that's nasty. So he worked with an ideal fluid at the end, irrotational, inviscid, what not. So the dream, the dream system for analytics. And that's how he derived this equation. Um, there is a candidate that, of course, is very close to an ideal fluid, or, uh, which is um, Bose-Einstein condensate. And in fact, if you look at Bill's derivation, one could argue he really derived it for a BUC because he's thrown everything else away. And these systems are, are ideal fluids, um, superfluids, dispose Einstein condensates. And again, people <coughs> are looking at sound waves and propagation within, and then they showed that you can write it in this form. OK, so the stepping stone from this to the other thing was that initially this was all classical systems. While this one here, the bottom one here, is really then a quantum system with quantized sound waves. Now, the situation I'm interested in, if you, want to ask, if you were to ask me what's the, what's the mass, I would say, well, one, one Navier-Stokes is not enough. You take um, a set of coupled Navier-Stokes. So you have two liquids or a gas liquid, and what you get is get this interface. So if you have immiscible flu um, uh, immiscible fluids that don't mix. So both gases and liquids are fluids, 
but here I have something that separates them, and this interface is what I'm interested in, the dynamics that happens on this interface. And the first ones to do this was Ralph Schützold and Bill Anner in, in 2002. They showed that these interface waves can be ideal um, uh, simulators, and that is related to the tunability of their propagation speed. So this was in classical fluids. And so the stepping stone then is also that um, there is a quantum version of this. Uh, so the, the, the most natural extension from a classical fluid to a superfluid would be superfluid helium. And superfluid helium, unlike um, Bose-Einstein condensates, they can also form interfaces because they are liquids. This is a gas and this is a liquid. And liquids are harder to deal with. In my opinion, more interesting, they have a more complicated or more complex effective field series. They have different regimes, they have interfaces. So I'm quite fascinated simply by these complicated systems, complicated and wonderful systems that they are. So, and when you want a simulator, it's the same as a numerical simulator, you want to have many knobs to explore the parameter space and set up many interesting systems. So, already if you take more fluids, you can set up more interesting physics. And so, um, that's also already that if you have an interface, you need two fluids to actually set up an interface, and that also gives you additional tunability. And this is generally true, the more knobs, the more interesting your simulator is. And if you allow me to use any system, not one specific, but I say, what can I do if I use the full potential of these analog gravity systems, you can set up these space-time geometries, flat space-time geometries in homogeneous or static fluids. You can set up black hole horizon in stationary flows. You can have cosmological scenarios in time-dependent uh, if your propagation speed is time-dependent, for example. And um, Sean and Sylvia have been talking about this. Okay, you can even change the signature of your emergent space-time geometry because what you have here in this GAB this G naught naught, the sign of that determines the signature. If it has the same sign as the spatial components here, where they're all positive on the spatial slice, uh, then it's um, an Euclidean signature. But if you have the G naught naught sign different, then you, we talk about this Lorentzian geometry. So you can tune a system from where you have hyperbolic equations, propagating modes, to elliptic equations, exponentially growing in dumping modes. Now, that's not all, because as I said before, these are interacting fields. And so when we, when we talk about sound waves, we usually throw all the interactions between the modes away. And of course, this is sometimes a good approximation, but if someone asks, what is the full effective field theory? And then it looks like that. So you have a kinetic term, you can set up a mass term, that mass term can be the mass term can be um, stable when m squared is larger than zero, so a nice mass term if you think of it. It can be an imaginary mass and it can be unstable and you can make it metastable and you get the false vacuum decay. So super cool this term. Then you can say, let me stick something in, let me interact with it locally, let me in put in a particle detector. I can detect, I can couple to the field and to the conjugate momentum of the field, super cool. And then I can say, well, how do the modes actually scatter with each other? And then you get all these combinations of between the density and the conjugate momentum and how they are, you stick them in, you get all these interacting terms. So it's wonderful, but it's a, you have to, of course, look at each system individually, but this is what you can do with them. That's sort of the totality, and some terms in some systems might not be there, and you can make them negligible, but this is, this is what the theory gives you to work with or the system to work with. Okay, so here we are. Um, they have super nice effective field theories. They are provided by these fluids, could be uh, super fluids or fluids, and the field theory is super exciting. And so what I'm interested in is to understand and really probe this effective field theory to an unprecedented level so that we really know these are the equations. And this is really not a trivial question, particular systems we're looking at. I want to develop methods and toolboxes for these fluids to actually extract this information. And there we use thermal field theory methods uh, from particle physics, cosmology, to actually study these field theories. Super cool. Um, 
get very deep insights. Now, when it comes to quantum field theory and curved space-time, at sort of the serious level in all these analogs, you could say, well, there's all these wonderful ideas and I want to turn them into reality. I want to have a system that undergoes Hawking radiation because I can't see it from a real black hole and I just also want to understand what are the conditions, the environmental conditions for this to happen. Um, but also starting an experimental area, you're training a whole generation of people that have both, that have very deep theoretical insights, but they also get a feeling what it means to do experiments, right? So you're, you're basically saying, look, it's not just theory, it is experiments, not perhaps for what the systems for which this book has been written, but this book has been written for a lot of systems. Okay, so that's where I feel. Well, in order to do that, you need to set up field theory simulators, and that's what we're doing here. And of course, the goal is that you simulate something that you can't calculate, that you first say, I make it work, and then I push myself into a space where the theories perhaps struggle to see if I can get some inspiration for something more and explore the parameter space. So this is why we built these field theory simulators to put these two things together, right? And then, of course, what is the driving force here? Well, it is quantum technology, um, and in particular, for, to set up these quantum simulators, um, um, what we are using superfluid helium systems, and also we need to then interact with this system using quantum sensing eventually, but we're slowly working towards this. Okay. So the simulators in Nottingham is a bit like the Christmas carols, the, the ghost from the past, the ghost from the present, and yet to come. So the ghost from the past is where our normal fluid interfaces, this is how we started setting up these um, black hole simulators, these are rotating vortex flows, and we're looking at interface waves interacting with this vortex, a, a, a big vortex that forms in the center, or uh, Sylvia and Sean's talk about uh, two liquids that don't mix, and what we're driving is parametric resonances in the system and compare how mode scattering occurs. So this is not quite the past, we're still working specifically on this one, but what we are doing or have already started, we are translating all of this to helium. And this is uh, an old picture of the setup, it looks much more involved and um, Pietro and Leonardo will talk about this as well. So we go to quantum fluid interfaces or quantum liquid, I should be written here. And then at the end of this month, we will get a new machine. Uh, we get an, um, a proper fridge. And with this one, we can go down from here around 1.8 Kelvin to 300 millikelvin. So we get colder and more quantum because eventually also we really want to deal with fragile quantum states. Right. So, right, I have to probably, how much time do I have left? Okay, so another reason why helium, so when it comes to quantum simulators, everybody would say the system to choose is ultra cold atom systems. These are the systems we, uh, which has been super successful, so why do we need another system, and especially another one that we have, you know, we already know for so many years. So why is it now, what, what has changed? Why do we, should we go back and study superfluid helium at these levels which I'm proposing here. <coughs> and um, I wanted to, ah, sorry, and I'm feel theory. Um, yeah. I wanted to go to some other slides first, so that's a bit of a pity. I'll come back to this, why superfluid helium, why is it so interesting, and what we know or don't know theoretically. And I think whenever you don't know something well theoretically, then experiments really make a lot of sense. <coughs> and I will come back to this thought, apologies. So, so what we have done first is we set up these uh, vortex flows. And in particular, why am I interested in any sort of vortex flows um, where you have a gigantic vortex, let's say, in the center of your system? And that is because uh, these things are called basta vortex flow. These are stationary draining fluid flows. And they are interesting because they have super cool um, flow, um, um, flow behavior. And in particular, this one here, this is not working, maybe this is working, yeah. 
So if you drain a, so it's a rotating fluid and it drains through the center, so it has an angular momentum and a radial component. And if you ask yourself, so how, how does a system like that actually drain? What is the resulting flow, flow field from this? And what is super interesting is that most of the, basically in the bulk, what, what's called the, uh, the bulk part of that flow, there's almost zero draining. All the draining happens through the boundary layers on the top and the boundary layers on the bottom. Now, because they can't really just cross each other, so what is happening on the bottom here, it's called this Ekman pumping. So when you come close to the center, instead of draining right away, you have an upwelling. It goes up, turns around, merges the thing from the top going down and drains. So this is already, you can see, very easily set this up in a classical system at home. And uh, this is a wonderfully complicated flow behavior. Now, one thing in superfluids that's not so well understood is boundary layer flows. So already here, there are things that are, you know, perhaps classically can be understood well. From a quantum perspective, they're quite challenging. Now, the first system that we set up was um, this um, um, big, so it's the warping comes from taking the picture, but this is sort of three meters long, one meter 50 wide, and the basin height is, uh, half a meter. So we, and we have a drain in the center and we get the angular momentum by inserting the fluid flow uh, in a way that you give the flow angular momentum. So we set up this um, giant vortices here, a bust up vortex in the center of the setup. What's a bit unusual is that usually when you were looking at vortex flows, you would rotate the whole setup. And this was a deliberate choice not to do it. And we did some tests that this would be all right. And what we did initially, then we studied how interface waves would interact with this vortex flow. And so more recently, what we did is to simply translate this to superfluid helium. And you will hear much more about this. So I can just <coughs> browse over this and refer to Petrus and Leonardo's talk. OK, what you can do, why is it interesting? So why is it interesting for um, curved space times. Well, rotating black hole configurations or rotating uh, curved space times, they exhibit the Plandora of physical um, effects that are really important, such as, for example, the black hole super radians. And this is what we built the big tank for. And this is the first experiment we did. Then by looking at the system, we realized that the vortex floor itself doesn't seem to be quite so, so quiet. It seems to give off some noise, which one could see by eye. And eventually, we figured out that these are the black hole ring down modes uh, that you can extract from this system. So this was the second experiment we did. OK, uh, we did more experiments, but I don't want to get into it. So it seemed just like from these classical experiments, it just seemed to work really well. All these processes that we expected to occur around black holes, they seem to also occur in this vortex flow. And in particular then, uh, and again, I should browse over this. So one of the first challenges we had uh, was to set up a vortex flow in superfluid helium. And this is what Patrick has been working on relentlessly over the last two years now uh, with Pietro and Leonardo. And wonderful work has come out of this. And you will hear more about that. And it's just sort of this is one of the few quantum vortex flow of this kind, stationary draining vortex flow in the world. There's one group in Japan who has, let's say, a similar setup. What is unique about it is also that it's fully transparent because we use magnetic coupling to drive a little, a little rotor inside that cryostat to recirculate the fluid. OK, so why, do I, why is this interesting? Because here we have a system that can set up, and as we've shown, uh, the biggest quantum vortex flows ever achieved. And you can explore how a quantum a, a vortex flow, which usually consists of quantized vortices, and I'm sure you will talk about that, how this can become classical. The open questions, there are so many open questions, how exactly this vortex dynamics, how vortex lines arrange themselves in such a system, the wave vortex interactions on that interface, that's what we want to study. And we want to derive sort of modeling support for that. And this is a really hard system. So as it is here, the full dynamics of this, I wouldn't know how one can simulate that. Thank you. OK. And then there, are, of course, from the curved space-time geometry perspective, there are many applications. Um, 
super interesting system. Now, why helium? And I have to just go through this. This is something from Carlo Barenghi's talk. There is no one theory for superfluid helium. And that is wonderful. So in, in fact, you can put yourself in a situation where you don't, have a theoretic, you don't have a good theoretical model for the dynamics of the system. If you don't have that, how do you do perturbation theory? How does it all work? And in particular, there is this distinction between irrotational and rotational. If it's irrotational, we use this Landau's two-fluid equation where you say I have a two-component flow, which is mixed, um, and there is a normal and a superfluid component, and depending on how cold or warm you are in this helium two-phase, you have either you know, 50-50 of it, you can have almost only normal component, or it's, if you're below a Kelvin, you have almost everything is superfluid component. The problem is, how do you add vortices to it, okay? So for this, if it's really cold, there is some modeling, assuming that you can use the cross pitayevsky equation. It doesn't really work so well, and it doesn't have an extension. You can't just extend this when you also have a normal component. The cross pitayevsky will give you an ideal fluid, not the Navier-Stokes equation. And then there are different ways, depending on what vortex modeling you want to do, there are different models. I'm not going into it because I'm running out of time. But clearly, from a theoretical point of view, this is very unsatisfying. But it's also perhaps a nice challenge to use experimentation to pinpoint down which models actually are applicable and give you the best match to experiment. Perhaps you can even go a bit further and give some insights for theorists, and Carlo Barenghi is working with us closely, um, to... to perhaps make this a bit more sensible, this whole picture. <coughs> right, non-equilibrium -equi field theory simulations. Um, Sylvia said that already I'm running out of time and Sean. So um, here really, these experiments, and just to say what <coughs> motivated me to look into this, I wanted to understand how well can I measure an interface and how well can I understand the effective field theory. Because what's happening on the interface is you have two, two liquids that mix. And sort of from a chemical process, the one is going into the other and vice versa. So it's a sort of a chemical balance where you form an interface. But the interface has a thickness. And so one of the questions I wanted to understand is, does this interface make sense below the scale of that thickness of the interface that you have a well-defined interface from an effective field theory point of view? And the answer is yes. And then also what I wanted to understand is when does it become linear and nonlinear? When is the transition? Because usually we always say when the amplitudes are small, it's linear, but what does this mean? And at which point can I not neglect my, my, my mode scattering in the system? So this is really was a test. This was the first test. And for me, this is the defining test that liquids are good quantum field theory simulators. OK. Now, I shouldn't go into it um, too much because it has been talked about. It's just that I thought it was really nice. So this is a snapshot taken from Feynman's last blackboard. Um, there are some big statements on here. Um, but he also said there are things he wanted to learn at the end of his life, things he hasn't quite understood. An accelerated temperature is one of the effects that he had on his blackboard as something he wanted to understand in more depth and work on it. Um, I'm browsing through it. Thankfully, Cisco did give a talk about this and how we, what I'm interested in here is, um, in particular, Jorma motivated me to get interested because I was evaluating all of his or being an examiner, internal examiner for all of his students. And uh, two things, whenever I asked them, how would you build this, they would just completely break apart in the exam. Um, but also there was this, you know, I use this coupling or that coupling and it shouldn't matter. And there was this sort of, Everything is allowed. And that bugged me a lot. And I said, well, let's go down and let's build a detector. And then none of this is possible. You have one way of modeling this. And I sort of say, look, can you make it work? So I was particularly interested. I want to build a particle detector uh, with Yama together and with Cisco and all the other people and Cameron here. Uh, but that sort of was the motivation for me. It was too much theory, too much freedom. Yama had too much of a good time, I felt. <laughs> so, um, right, and that brings us to uh, the last parts. I really need to, to run through it. So, um, how do we interact with it? And so, usually there was always like, people would go through extremely great lengths, like Jeff, who set up this wonderful 
uh, you know, black hole horizons in one plus one in one dimensional BSEs and saw all these nice effects. And all, most of the effect was really on setting up um, the background flow. And when you looked at the detection methods, they were sort of like, you know, they were high end, super high end, high class, but they were always sort of the conventional ones. So there were two issues here. There were no conventional ones for, li for liquids, so for the interfaces, but also, for example, the Andro effect is a wonderful, it's a measurement, and it's a local measurement, and you don't immediately destroy your whole quantum field theory. So clearly, the whole measurement, you need to treat it equally, um, take it equally serious as setting up the background flow. So what we needed to do, we needed to opt up our game, and the way we do it is we use uh, interferometric techniques. And so this is a picture of our new cryos that will come at uh, the end of the month. We have nothing to put it on, of course, because uh, something unusual happened. They said we would get it next year, early next year, in January. So I was expecting it in March, but we're getting it earlier. So it's the first time that happened to me. Um, but so with this, we can go down to 300 millikevin, and we will be working with um, synferm helium systems. And we will set up global detection methods, which Vita will tell you all about. And we will try, and this is the hard one, to set up local detectors and to either see what's left behind, as Adam said, as something you left behind, or perhaps, if we can get it going, extract that signal also from our detector directly. What is a detector is a completely different question. The laser beam is not the detector. It's part of the detection scheme. Right, so this is what Victor will be talking about. And the scientific summary, and then I need to get another three minutes, hopefully. So the primary objectives really are to establish quantum liquids as a groundbreaking uh, finite temperature non-equilibrium quantum field theory simulators. Big words. Um, this is not to replace or saying that this is better than ultra-cold atom system because that would simply not be right. They are different, but they have something to offer, something interesting. They can have the capacity to accommodate substantially larger system sizes. And this is something Pietro and Leonardo will show that this actually can give you an advantage. They have inherent strong interactions because they're liquids, not gases. Interacting quantum field series are hard and interesting. So that's what you want to do, they're hard problems. Um, you can actually fix the temperature. You can have a quantum field theory at finite controllable temperature and you can have the system for 50 hours in that state something the BSE people can't do. To really have a finite temperature and set that and regulate it. And you have, depending on where you are, of course, if you're in the super fragile, you know, one uh, millikelvin regime, there's no hope in there, perhaps, then you have to worry again. But in the regimes we are looking at, there are non-destructive spatial and temporal analysis. So we have unequal time and unequal space. We, we can reconstruct everything from our measurements. Okay, so that's why I work on this. And now I get the last five minutes to just say a bit about going beyond the science. So if you come to Nottingham, one of the things I'm very proud of is what else we are doing. And the first thing we're, we are doing, we do little events like we try to inspire the next generation and Leonardo put a wonderful picture together, and, um, video, and that only works if I go out. So we did this, this special event.
think I have to stop for the time, but uh, because we're running short of time. But every time I see that video, it makes me uh, tremendously happy. So this is one thing we're doing. We're also commissioning artwork, uh, working with artists. So we formed an art lab that sort of, I think, was originated in our group together with Ulrike Kuchner. And uh, we did sort of the first events of this, get some started and motivate colleagues to follow. The first artist in residence we had in the art lab in the room you saw where all the kids were drawing and being creative. That was um, Konrad Schokras, an extraordinary artist, extremely inspiring to talk to him. And he will design for us an, uh, an artwork that will be in our art science exhibition to take place at the beginning of 2025 for three months on the Arts Gallery on campus. It's a collaboration with Lakeside Arts. And what he symbolizes here is a black hole ring down uh, using two bronze bells that move through this mesh where there are magnets on the antenna. The, the antenna represent the space-time fabric and the, the, the bells, the black holes, and how they send <coughs> gravitational wave through the universe. So this is one thing we're doing. We're working with artists as well. Um, we have, and then I'm starting, stopping very quickly then, um, uh, the Art Lab itself, we also do things here. So Patrick spent a lot of time of putting this nice um, Lego interferometer kit together, um, which then is a working interferometer, which we're building for kids to come and to train. And so that's also part of it. We want the kids to build their own gravitational wave interferometer here. We work on impact together. Um, we develop sensors here. This is a sensor which we exhibited yesterday um, on the National Quantum Technology Showcase. Um, we have two pending patent applications in the group, um, one for quite a long time. So uh, I have a slide why the UK. Um, there has been, and it is a bit of an issue, Brexit didn't make us the most popular country in Europe. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this field um, or quantum sciences, the UK is absolutely committed, just recently put 2.5 billion into quantum sciences and fundamental physics and um, the overarching program that also funds this quantum simulators for fundamental physics network that um, is also be funded through this. And as it looks like, it will be further supported beyond the first phase of the funding. So um, there are, the UK is a great place because we're using quantum technology uh, for fundamental physics more generally. And there are seven large grants and quantum simulators for fundamental physics is one of them. But they're also building detectors for um, dark matter, for axion fields, for um, many wonderful, wonderful different things. If you look at the QR code, you can look up all the wonderful science. And that leaves me with the last slide, and I tried to avoid looking a camera on, but uh, as Jorma said already, um, join us. We're always looking for, for students, motivated, good students, that like to interact and be in such a, let's say, um, perhaps a bit unusual, but a very open environment. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Silke, for the talk. Are there any questions? Anyone second thoughts now? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, Silka. So uh, you mentioned before that the philosophy is if two systems obey the same equation and the physics is the same, how much can you say about the more fundamental structure of uh, each system? Can you learn about the gravitational system from the condensed matter system? So, I mean, this is, to be honest, partially also why um, Lena, so Lena basically suggested she was working in the lab and she did her um, um, master's in gravity, particle and fields and this, in her dissertation she ended up in our lab. And uh, so she knows the math as well, which I think is really remarkable for a philosopher and she did this while she was an associate professor here. So, and she did extremely well in the mark, so she's a very remarkable person. But then, of course, also how much can you learn about the, 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 the target system and whatnot? There's this whole language about this. So this is one thing we want to discuss. Uh, for me, this um, a lot, I'm a bit more of a practical person. I'm thinking of anything that relates on something being exactly right, any process that when you deviate a little bit, and, uh, because nature is not this way, that there is only one effect happening and all the other physics is just not there. 
So this robustness and universality and how you learn how to extract the information from the systems and what it means ultimately forces you to understand these effects beyond what perhaps you could come up when you have a piece of paper and a pen um, working things out. So there are things like um, how, much can, how much further can it go? So can you, can you use this system if you set them up well? to perhaps go in a parameter space to learn something you couldn't calculate, use it really as a simulator. Um, for a, a back reaction processes, well, you can also simulate that, but a true a quantum system, it's not so clear how this works. Um, you could, like the false vacuum decay, that's a really hard case. Could you see some signatures coming out which we haven't predicted? Could we find new effects? And then you would need to check if really in the gravitational side, or in the, um, this is still there. So you cannot just say, I found something in the analogs. It should also be in the other. But also the depth of this, this analogy needs to also be investigated further. So it's a hard question. Um, been asked many times, mostly in grant, when it comes to grant applications and reviews and papers and referee reports and interviews. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful question, and Lina is going to answer this in the next year. Um, that's, that's all I can say. To Me too. <laughs> okay, if there aren't any more questions, then thanks, Silke, once again.